chairman of the editorial board and founder of the IIC Quarterly, our esteemed chief guest, Honorable Mr. Justice P.S. Narasimha, Justice Supreme Court of India, distinguished speakers, senior advocate, retired justice, Ms. Anjana Prakash, and Dr. Argo Sengupta, trustees of the IIC, director, Mr. K. N. Srivastav, secretary, Mr. Kamal Wali, and friends. I welcome you all to the launch of this issue of the IIC quarterly on the working of the Indian Constitution. The theme for these annual issues is um, decided at an editorial board meeting. From amongst four or five options, we decide, we'll pick one. And the Constitution has been a subject that has come up on more than one occasion. And uh, as I think it went as far back as maybe four or five years ago, Professor Neera Chandok had also suggested that we do an issue on the Constitution, but we didn't know how. It was such a vast canvas that uh, we were intimidated by it, really. But today, since we found, we see around us, there is a lot of interest among the ordinary citizen on how the Constitution works, what it, <coughs> sorry, what it offers us. So we thought this would be a good time to bring out uh, this kind of an issue. And, um, for, and I met, uh, I let Dr. Orgos and Gupta tell you more about the volume. And of course, you're going to buy it on your way out. So I won't go any further on that. But uh, before I hand over the proceedings to uh, Dr. Karan Singh, I would like to thank our chief guest and speakers for giving us their time. I believe today is also the first day of court, so it must have been extra difficult. A uh, big thank you to Orgo, uh, who despite several professional and personal commitments, never once let this project slide, and neither did he need any coercion to come on board when I asked him if he would be guest editor. So thank you, Orgo. You're right here, sorry. <laughs> Um, of course, uh, you don't have a volume without contributors. Some of you have been so good to come out and, and be here for us, and Pratik is here too. So nice of you, Mr. Uh, Justice Gupta was in fact not going to be here, but he's made it, and I'm so happy to have there you here with us. There are lots of reserve seats here in front. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Invisible reservees. <laughs> and uh, finally, I'd like to thank the editorial team. I now request Dr. Karan Singh to release the journal, share his thoughts, and then take over the proceedings. We'll release it first? Thank you. Yeah. Or speak first? No. Release. Stand up and have a photo opportunity. So we all have to get up. Yes, this is what the Americans call a photo opportunity. <laughs> Shall I pull the chair back? Well, thank you so much. Justice uh, P.S. Narasimha Garu, Justice Anjana Prakash, Dr. Argus Sen Gupta, Editor Umita Goyal, distinguished members of the audience, representatives of the press and electronic media, and friends. Welcome to the release of another one of our double issues. Over the uh, decades, what we've done, just uh, is that we have separate issues, and once a year we have a double issue on a specific topic. And those invariably become books and have now become collector's items. You can't get them any longer. This is one of them. Uh, this is the second time we were saying a, a analysis of the Indian Constitution. Many years ago, when I was president of IIC, we set up a group with, under my chairmanship with Subhash Kashyap as the convener. And we did a lot of work and we came out with a publication on perspectives on the Indian Constitution, which is very, this in a way is a follow-up to that. Because if you go back to that, if you can find it, many of the problems that we looked at at that stage are still with us and some new ones have come up. Um, the Constitution, you know, I am older than, some of you also are older than the Republic. So I've seen the whole panorama of how India has developed from 1947 over 75 years. 
I remember, I remember the Union Jack flying over Rashtrapati Bhavan, for example. And uh, we had our own flag in JNK, and then uh, all the changes. And from Jawaharlal Nehru to Narendra Modi, all the prime ministers, and each one has its own fascination. And the constitution has been a common link. From 1950 onwards, after two and a half years of intensive discussion in the Constituent Assembly, I don't think people now realize how much discussion there was on every item. If you look up the records, you will find there was a discussion on every clause. Two and a half years, and then finally they came out with what I consider to be a truly remarkable. Uh, in, uh, institution which is the constitution of india surely the longest and the most detailed constitution of any country in the world in fact uh, if i may say so mr mali i am one of the few people who actually signed the constitution into law as arghav sen gupta will tell you the constitution of jammu and kashmir much maligned though it now is was a proper constitution in 1956 i remember signing it into law so i've been very closely involved with constitutions uh, also um, i remember because one of the main highlights of course of our constitution are f- fundamental rights but also fundamental duties i was on the drafting committee of the fundamental duties a committee headed by sardar swaran singh and i think they are a remarkable statement of our i i ideals and that is the only part of the constitution that was not nullified by the post emergency government is still there now um how do we assess a constitution like this one major point which i can immediately say it has brought millions of people who were outside the pale into the political system i mean all the scheduled castes all the scheduled tribes all the they intensely backward they were all out outside they, no no nobody bothered about them for centuries and centuries they were brought into the mainstream by the constitution of india i think that itself that social revolution is not complete yet mind you but a major breakthrough a major breakthrough reservations for the scheduled castes and for the scheduled tribes Uh, for example uh, for jnk now for the first time the gujars are going to get seats because they are scheduled tribes under the constitution they have to be given a certain number of seats so the hindu code bill and others we may be now forgotten but can you imagine what it would have been like for hindus who have lived with the old laws which were just not applicable any longer so this major revolution that the constitution brought about i think has to be first of all understood uh, the, the 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 revolutionary uh, changes and of course uh, one can go into a lot of uh, other details but uh, when a constitution collapses look what's happening in sri lanka they also had a constitution like we did perfectly good constitution once it collapses chaos so what stands between chaos and uh, and as is is the constitution basically despite changes in uh, regimes and so on it's the constitution which stands so i for one am a great admirer of, of of the constitution and in this issue we have had a number of of very interesting articles by a group of uh, intellectuals drawn from all over india and from different uh, strata so i think this volume is going to be a major contribution to a understand understanding and a rediscovery of the constitution in all its aspects with its weaknesses and there are many money power is one of the greatest weaknesses we have not been able to prevent the power of money in elections as a result of which you have to be a multimillionaire to fight an election to get a ticket itself you have to spend crores of rupees how will you fight an election where is the equality we haven't been able to solve that one i'm afraid 
and uh, disruptions of the house which take place which to, to my mind are, are really a denial of democracy i'm not blaming any particular party every party has done it when they're in the opposition nothing is more painful i i've been 40 years in parliament this uh, mega room and uh, nothing is more painful than to see people rushing into the well of the house and shouting slogans i mean what sort of democratic working is that it's not a fault of the constitution mind you it's the fault of the people who work the constitution who are supposed to work the constitution so there are very many things i will not take up much time i have to i now introduce our speakers we have of course uh, justice wait wait where is my i thought i had something no this is no but i had a i had a detailed bio data no, that is you that is you yes you nahi aap ye le lijiye you know thank you <laughs> i had it somewhere all underlined and <laughs> doesn't have the name he is from the nizam college hyderabad he is a pakka mulki and uh, he pursued law in delhi university and uh, enrolled as an advocate in practice for high courts and civil courts and tribunals and uh, all sorts of uh, legal situations member of the supreme court legal aid committee and then he was appointed additional solicitor general of india in 2014 and did a lot of other things international tribunal for the of law of the sea in hamburg he represented uh, india there and also at the permanent court of arbitration the pca and he's part of the governing body of the national legal services authority of india nalsa mm, closely connected associated mediation and conciliation so i won't go into too much but he was elevated as a judge directly from the bar on 31st august 2021 this is your first year in the supreme <laughs> court uh, <coughs> then we have our, our second speaker justice anjana prakash the former judge of the high court of patna where she was there for several years and uh, then she designated as senior advocate upon her retirement and practices in the supreme court of india and the delhi high court she is a complete writer having revised and edited classical legal texts on criminal law and writes on a lot of popular issues a strong believer in human rights and the rule of law and committed to the cause of social justice as i hope you all are ultimately and argesen gupta our third <coughs> speaker is the founder and research director of the vidhi center for legal policy the policy a, a legal think tank and his areas of research include constitutional law and he is the author of independence and accountability of the indian higher judiciary and has just completed a book if you please on the much maligned article 370 with which i was very closely involved so we look forward to reading that book soon so that's it uh, i request you sir पार्लियामेंट एंड अब great scholar that's what really matters so far as i am concerned really great scholar ranjana prakash ji my former colleague i would like to call <laughs> former judge and uh, lawyer argya sen gupta uh, he has argued very many important cases and i was also with him when he had argued it and um, he is also one of the persons who has really started uh, an institution of uh, legal research which was really lacking uh, for many years a vibrant institution mr srivatsava 
Mr. Mm. Omita Goel. I am happy to participate in the release of this quarterly working of the Indian Constitution. And uh, I must congratulate Omita uh, for one reason, because uh, Argya, I must be thankful to him, gave me a copy of uh, the working of the Indian Constitution, which I carried with me on Friday to Nagpur. And I was reading the articles in it. There's an article by Justice Madan Loko. There is also an article by Justice Deepak Gupta. And I couldn't complete it. On my way back, I again <laughs> read many of those articles. What is very, very interesting about uh, this book, which I wanted to share with you, is um, the way it is been structured. I think all of you will go through it. And uh, the book has uh, five chapters, which are really speaking the five great values on the basis of which we have built our constitution. <laughs> they have divided <laughs> it into sovereignty, socialism, secularism, democracy, and republic. And it is on that basis that each of these articles have been made. And uh, they are really uh, connected to one another. On sovereignty, of course, Justice Deepak Gupta's articles is there. And uh, very importantly, in the context of uh, sovereignty, we have 377. And a recent judgment of the Supreme Court, which uh, related to the way the GST is to be interpreted, is directly on the point. And uh, Thomas Isaac has written an article on this. I would also want to tell you that socialism Articles relating to public health, Manrega. Manrega is a matter which <coughs> was argued and <laughs> argued before Justice <coughs> Madan Lokur over a period of time and exactly relating to how the goods and services must be distributed across the board to everybody, how they must reach the people is the essence of the judgment that he had delivered in Manrega. Secularism, of course, and in that there is a very interesting chapter which uh, I liked it very much. It's a photo essay which you will all see and enjoy. We the people. We the people. And it speaks for itself. <coughs> the article just speaks for itself. <coughs> and uh, of course, on secularism, other articles. On democracy, very in interestingly, as his, uh, Dr. Karan Singh has indicated, on 10th schedule, I wish there was an article on 10th schedule. It isn't there. That is one of the very, very important aspects on which the democracies, democracy is to be judged. Initially, when the challenge to 10th schedule was raised before the Supreme Court by a constitution bench, it was upheld. And uh, Justice Venkata Chela said, we must permit an experiment in 10th schedule, even though very many defects were shown. I had written an article on 10 schedule in saying that it's a failed experiment. The way it has worked, uh, all of us have seen. It didn't really uh, enable the democracy to work in its pristine manner. The another aspect which is very, very important so far as democracy is concerned is the functioning of the election commission also, which has been indicated. And lastly, about the republic part of it, I really like the way it's been organized here again. Republic is, all of us were, if I may use the expression of uh, Mr. Kannabiran, senior advocate, we were all subjects at one point of time in our, li in our lives, Indian people. With the making of the constitution, we have all become citizens. So it is in this context that republic is to be seen and judged <clears throat> and how are we as uh, citizens we are people from different walks of life here organized are these articles relating to religious minorities transgender persons socio-economic inclusion women tribal groups and caste so it completes us in a way as people coming from various parts and having various ideas and identities, so to say. The working of the Indian constitution 
throws different perspectives the way we understand the working the way we participate in the democracy the views are very varied and this leads to a contest and competing ideas and discussion which is very very important for all of us to consider for a vibrant democracy it's extremely necessary what i want to share with you is only in the context of my experience as a lawyer and just a 8 months judge nothing more than that one aspect about which i can speak is uh, about the judiciary and the way the courts have functioned which is an integral part of the working of the constitution on this actually there is no contest all other article many of these articles there are perspectives on which there is a debate and what i am sharing with you is an aspect on which there is really no contest and for that reason perhaps there is no debate and it's very simple aspect of it this relates to the way in which the courts are able to function or not function in i am speaking about the pendency of the matters which is has a direct relation to the working of the courts 1958 the first law commission report uh, the the 14th law commission report settlewards report in which he had indicated the difficulties the courts are facing and the pendency of the matters and very important aspect relating to making of a precedent for courts to follow and also reporting of a precedent which precedents must be reported which should not be reported that becomes very important because the development of law depends on a precedent if a supreme court <coughs> lays down a law everybody will follow it they have to follow it because that's the mandate of the constitution same so far as the high court is concerned what are what is the principle on the basis of which a judgment is to be made what is the principle on the basis of which a judgment must get reported there is an enormous criticism as it stood in 1958 about the way the judgments were made the way the judgments were reported and who has the uh, or the the power to report a judgment i am indicating this uh, 14th uh, law commission report for the simple reason that if we read this report today entirety of the report will apply to the facts uh, to to the present circumstances there is no difference I mean, things have worsened only then the question is uh, from 1958 to 2022 the way the constitution worked in the context of the courts functioning the disposal of the cases is the question as a as a judge just 8 months as i sit to dispose of matters i used to do matters which were very high end matters as i was a lawyer but as a judge <coughs> matters which never used to come to me <coughs> i started hearing those matters pending since last 10 years 15 years matrimonial matters of 18 years pending what relevancy it is to hear matters and dispose of institutions uh, business houses collapse because by the time the matter comes up for hearing nothing remains the this is where i don't think as i was indicating there is no difference of opinion on this everybody agrees that these pendencies are actually killing the institution of disposal of cases but then the question is it baffles me if 58 this was a question raised we are still raising the question just madan lokur was head of the e committee to dispose of 
lot of effort was made to deal with it but this is an aspect which we were not able to grapple we couldn't do anything at all so far as this aspect is concerned this reflects really the working of the constitution so far as the judiciary is concerned i don't want to talk about other speakers are there larger issues but to me this is immediate and it can't be postponed and it questions the very purpose object and the living of the institution itself what are we to do when uh, a husband and wife have difference of opinion they have already spent 5 years before a trial court another 10 years before the high court and then it's pending here in the supreme court for another 10 years there is no methodology by which you know we we take up matters and then do it we need to work on this all that i am saying is intentions are very good i am not blaming anybody but then this is an aspect that we have to apply our mind we don't have much time and there this can't be postponed any further any further there are suggestions which have been made for early disposal of cases so that the institution becomes relevant today it has become irrelevant for a common so it has to be made relevant and uh, there must be a confidence that if i go to the court i will get a relief quickly that we must restore at the lowest level and uh, need for it to be done according to me is felt maximum in the civil courts in our country and reforms can be brought about i will conclude with this because of the number of other speakers i will conclude with this by just indicating that uh, reforms must be brought about there are uh, in the regular courts commencing from the civil court to the high court and then the supreme court it's not merely the number of judges the method and manner by which the judges would conduct the proceedings and dispose of alternative institutions have been created in the form of tribunals which is again not very satisfactorily worked then the third alt alternative we thought the arbitration would make any difference then the judges would tell us where we are so far as arbitration is concerned and then we thought yet another methodology is by mediation which is a statute which is supposed to be uh, coming in the next parliamentary session i was i was told that uh, it's all ready we are trying to invent one something or the other but ultimately the answers must be found there is another su another suggestion which i have have also endorsed and i have been saying that civil court in the district courts the district courts must be empowered to regulate the executive power by filing a suits and injunctions against the collectors instead of running to the high courts that is possible article 32 also enables enforcement of fundamental rights through any other court which includes a district court but <coughs> nobody has utilized that power <coughs> so we need to innovatively think about all this and bring about changes which are compelling according to this is the first time that i have been speaking and i am virtually sharing my thoughts after 8 months of a of being a judge of a supreme court so with these thoughts i thank you very much uh, amita thank you thank you dr karan singh thank you very much thank you everybody for giving me this opportunity <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for a very thoughtful uh, speech. Uh, uh, I'm sure people will take note of the points that you've made mentioned. <coughs> the fact that many crores of cases are pending. Yeah, that's right. It, I think it's it's a disgrace. Yes. It's a disaster. Disaster. Two or three crore cases pending. Judges vacant. Why are there vacancies? I don't understand. why there should be a single vacancy for more than one day all this nonsense about this committee and that committee and this pop what is this you are depriving the citizens of india of justice by keeping 
courts uh, uh, vacant. Many cases vacant. Why is why so? That somebody should do a case against whoever it is who is responsible for that. It's not that easy. Is, is it not so? <laughs> I mean, how many? A lot of difficulties. <coughs> <in it. coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I've just come from Kashmir. <coughs> well, the weather is lovely. Also picked up an attack of bronchitis, so I don't know. So, uh, thank you very much, thank sir. You, sir. I, I, I won't comment upon anything you said because that is entirely. You need to leave. You, say, yeah. you have to go. I have to go. Yes. I have he wants to leave. Okay. Huh? Should I release you now? Jal Sab has to go somewhere, so uh, he's going to take leave. Thank you very much. I must sir. apologize to all of you. I'm sorry for this prior meeting that I had. So, sorry for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Now I can leave this. Thanks. Somebody see you. Sorry, to please contain. Sorry for disturbing. We have not told. We have not told. We have not told. Somebody like Sam. Push the chair to this side. Why don't you move it? Why don't you come? I am. Just take your name. In case I'm going to stand now. I have now a request to Justice. Anjana Prakash to address us. Would you like to hear your name? She's going to be there. She's going to stay. I've already come here. <laughs> Fast forwarded myself. Uh, respected members on the dais, of the dais, I won't take much time, but I'm sure, you know, whatever I'm going to speak is going to be a reflection of what all of us are going through and thinking. This is my insight into the whole exercise. Not, notwithstanding, uh, first of all, I must thank uh, Omita for having taken out such a fine quarterly, which contains articles of Justice Lokur, Justice Gupta, very incisive, very engaging, and I'm sure an education for a lot of us. And uh, notwithstanding the generous, uh, generous introduction of myself, I stand before you as an ordinary citizen who is in a state of perpetual dilemma. To begin with, let us examine what working of the Indian constitution means to the vast section of the Indian population. Justice Natsima said, when once the republic was formed, we became from subjects to citizens. I don't agree with him. We are still subjects, unfortunately. I do not boast of any superior knowledge, but my experience tells me that it means nothing to the ordinary public as to what you've transformed yourself in the written constitution. All this talk about the citizens being equal partners and stakeholders in a democracy is big talk, big and empty talk. For most, the government is a my bab ki sarkar elections which are now advertised as festivals teohar hai rest solely on the casting of votes in the interest of the various candidates not the populace so what happens is that the person who's chosen or who's a candidate it is only his interests which are safeguarded it is unfortunate and yet we call ourselves citizens within the state. That's not entirely true. I mean, there are many people who don't have a personal interest also. Oh, yes, yes. Politics. Some of you, yes. But, yes, maybe, maybe, yes, sir. There is no element of power having been passed. Well, the fact of the matter is this, sir, that there is no element of power having <coughs> been passed down to the ordinary voter on account of his having cast the vote. If indeed the voter was an equal stakeholder, what explains the negation of the state as a welfare state promised by the constitution, sir? What explains the withdrawal of the state in existing 
public ex infrastructure like health, education, community housing, essentials, water and electricity, and even life insurance now. We all know that for every, for every one AIMS built in a state, there are at least 10 private hospitals which come up in the vicinity and benefit from the footfall. This, while the government hospitals are running on a shortage of doctors and nursing staff on account of non-appointment. They thus run on short staff or had hoc staff. Similar is the case of education, where mushrooming of unaffordable private institution is the norm, which servant's son can afford a private education despite whatever the candidate, how good the candidate may be, sir. Similar is the case of education, I would say. To add to the problem is the complex discriminatory system existing anywhere and everywhere, and the blatant interplay of power game. Uh, in 1989, one Kimberly Crenshaw, who was an advocate and a civil rights uh, uh, activist in US came up with a term which she said was intersectional feminism, where she argued that various forms of inequality often operate together <laughs> and exasperate each other. <laughs> Simply put, she argued that even within the various broad class of discriminated groups, there were further classes of discrimination which were not necessarily similar. This is equally true in the Indian context where you see classes of persons discriminated on account of gender, caste, disability, orientation, faith, and even areas of their location. For example, of a rural poor of a certain caste in respect to access to water, he may be discriminated for the reason that he is not allowed to take water from the common well or pond. But a rural, but an urban poor may not have access to potable water at all. He may have to buy, even in Delhi, I know my driver and my, my maids, they buy water every day because they, they, they don't have any potable water. This is the plight. So who's, how are we talking about this, that from subjects we become citizens? Further, Thus, while there may be, that is why, while there may be overlapping or concurrence of some forms of deprivation, the depth and relationships between them may be contextual. In every context, you will see that there is some form of discrimination or the other for reasons of location. And now it's become even worse that areas and localities are being, uh, being cordoned off as, you know, belonging to different communities. What do you say to this? It is actually our denial to see inequality as our problem that has led to this. We always think in terms of inequality being somebody else's problem, others' problem. Unless we see this inequality as our problem, nothing is going to improve. In this background, what is the meaning of living in a welfare state for an ordinary citizen is my dilemma. The educated understand that the constitution provided for separation of powers by which each institution is considered as, as an independent living entity. The problem not, not lies not in seeing itself as, as an independent entity. It is acknowledging the other institution as an independent entity which deserves respect. So what happens is that every instance of the executive not following the recommendations of the collegium, to my mind, is in of, uh, collegium to the post of a judge or the search mm -hmm. committee to fill up uh, uh, the tribunal heads, according to me, is an act of disrespect, which also disc indirectly discredits the executive. And we have no option but to you know, bear it all with a grin. The constant attacks on the collegium system on a silly ground, that it is the only institution which appoints its own, is a case in point. The simple reply is that who else but a judge before whom a lawyer appears will judge his cap capability? And doesn't the executive have the system of ACP, ACR, etc. 
to evaluate its subordinates on the basis of which we are promoted. They do it too. We were talking about, Justice Narsimha was talking about pendency. I'm sure a lot of you know that the budgetary allocation for the judiciary is a dismal 0.1% as compared to 2% of the GDP in defense. This has led to the poor infrastructure and lack of adequate strength of the judges. So we know the problems and we know the solutions and yet not enough is being done to solve this. Having said this, I must confess I am a great advocate of self-introspection. One knows that the only thing that sets apart a judicial officer from any other is the moral authority he wields. This moral authority does not come in the form of deliverance of judgment alone, but also in the manner in which it has been adjudicated. This is important. The process is as, equal, as important as the final judgment in my mind. If there is uh, this, uh, one minute please. The judiciary must ask whether there is indeed a separation of powers. If there is, then how is it that the armed with the executive powers that people's homes are raised by bulldozers? Are these acts legal? When Article 21 protects a person from arbitrary arrest, why is a court hesitant to protect such a citizen? We're talking about celebrating the Constitution. We talk about, we know about the separation of powers, but what do we do? Are we ensuring the separation of powers and protecting everyone equally before law? That is for everyone to see. And why the judiciary, according to me, must be careful in ensuring that it does not encroach upon the jurisdiction of others, but it also must ensure that there is no encroachment on its jurisdiction as well. And this is very, very important because according to me, every institution being a living entity has its own role, its own obligations, its own rights. Now, when you talk about the rights of a judiciary, it is, is its right to be independent and it is obligated to do justice according to the constitution. So why don't we recognize this right of ours? Why is the judiciary failing to recognize its right to independence? The judiciary, according to me, must be careful in ensuring that it does not, uh, I'm sorry, it's once again, I've just changed my glasses, I think. <laughs> Shakespeare, in the play Julius Caesar had said, the fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves, for we are underlings. I don't, you know, I don't agree with the latter part. I believe that, yes, the fault does not lie in our stars, but in ourselves. But despite the fact, and also agree that we are underlings, but do not agree that the fault is that because we are underlings and therefore there is no solution. I think that despite our limitations, even as underlings, we can rise above ourselves on the strength of the Constitution. And this, this strength, unless you know we, we use this strength, the Constitution is not going to be a workable document. That's, that's all that I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Andhra uh, for a very, <coughs> very spirited uh, Sorry if I talk. You, sir. No, no, not at all. Where, are, where is your seat? There. We've all confused we our seats. We've all changed our seats. What are you I think people know me now. Andhra Prakash, what is it? Yeah, he says that's okay, sir. Now they know me. I don't need to be put on a test identification no, no, no. parade. <coughs> <coughs> you made some very pertinent remarks about the working of the Constitution. Not so much on the Constitution itself, but the working. And the whole, the whole uh, theme of this is not only the Constitution, but how is it worked. For example, as I said, it's the disruption of the House does not end the Constitution. If there's vast... Uh, money power that's not in the Constitution. So the problem is, while working the Constitution, there have been all sorts of, uh, uh, shall we say, not deviations or very negative developments, and you've pointed some of them out. Our third speaker now is Argya Sen Gupta, who, as I said, is founder of the Vidhi Center, 
is also the co-editor of this, uh, uh, this issue. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Singh. Um, when Justice Prakash was speaking, I was wondering that there's a reason why two justices, one fledgling and one former, can disagree with each other on the question as to whether we are citizens or subjects. And that's because we do have a constitution. And that's because the constitution does allow us the freedom of speech and expression. While, of course, that freedom is certainly at all points of time subject to great threat, right from the First Amendment passed by Nehru's government right up to today, where you can be jailed for making an, for an innocuous tweet. The fact is this freedom has always been under threat. But the Constitution allows us the framework to articulate our criticism. So with great respect, mm -hmm. ma'am, I do think we are citizens. We are not subjects. If we were subjects, then we would not have had this right, and we would not have been able to criticize it. But we are not citizens. And we haven't, we have, we are not citizens in a way that we have understood and got for ourselves all the attributes of citizenship that citizenship should give. And I think that <clears throat> resonates uh, well with one of the essays in the volume. Um, this is an essay which is an unusual essay for uh, a volume on the Constitution uh, because it's an essay which is part interview, part essay of a uh, of Tamil film director. Uh, Mari Selvaraj, who has made a recent film called Karnan, which I suggest that recommend for everyone to see. Now, there's a particular scene in this film, Karnan, which I think is quite evocative, where policemen mercilessly torture a group of Dalit villagers uh, in a police station. And this has <clears throat> inspiration from several real life incidents that have taken place in Tamil Nadu. Their crime, their crime was that they requested that the local bus stops at a bus stop in their village so that Dalit youth could go to the town and they didn't have to walk to the next village. A portrait of B.R. Ambedkar hangs above the police station, silently witnessing the carnage that uh, happens in front of him. The carnage of the values of justice, liberty, equality, and fraternity that the Constitution of India promises every citizen. I think that scene brings out the searing <coughs> irony that is the Constitution, and that is something of what Justice Prakash was also trying to say, which is that it's a charter of promises. Its enactment was supposed to herald a new and glorious dawn in India where everyone was supposed to be free and equal citizens. But we know that seven decades on, that the Constitution is still very much a work in progress. Um, and this is something that the president of the Constituent Assembly and the first uh, president of India, Rajendra Prasad, had also reminded us that the working of the Constitution, uh, and I quote, requires greater devotion, greater care, greater application, and greater sacrifice, unquote. And he hoped that the citizens of the country would have the wherewithal to be up to this task. Now, how have we fared in the seven decades since the Constitution has been in existence? In India today, I think we can widely say that, I mean, we can safely say that the Constitution is a widely celebrated document. Mm -hmm. But it's one whose contents and ownership lie firmly and unfortunately within the legal fraternity. This is something that in the Constituent Assembly, the key task of drafting its provisions was left to Dr. B. R. Ambedkar and a group of very eminent lawyers. The reason why we hear of the Constitution in our everyday news is because of a judgment of the Supreme Court. Uh, and media interviews on that judgment at 9 o'clock given by some senior advocate or the other. So I think it is basically judges and lawyers who have been keepers of the constitution flame for the last seven decades. But surely the constitution of India <coughs> cannot always remain a document for lawyers and judges alone. And this is the animating thought behind this volume on the working of the constitution of India. That how do we take the constitution outside the ivory tower of the law? And so you will find articles by activists, filmmakers, bureaucrats, uh, politicians, uh, apart from lawyers and judges as well. Couldn't exclude uh, folks from the fraternity entirely. But that's because we want to show that the constitution matters to us all. Uh, so a few words about the, the volume itself. This volume is uh, on the 75th, is coming at the, in the year of the 75th year of India's independence. We are looking to assess the choices that are made by the constitution. As Dr. Karan Singh pointed out right at the outset, its strengths, but also its weaknesses. And most critically, how these have played out on the ground. The most significant symbolic impact of the constitution has, has really been its preamble. This is something that has really traversed across and is not a document for lawyers and judges alone. While every word of the preamble is laden with meaning, we all know in this room that there are five that stand out, that India is a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. 
and Jawaharlal Nehru speaking in the Constituent Assembly uh, during the time the Objectives Resolution was being framed, and the Objectives Resolution was the precursor of the preamble, said in very categorical terms that India is bound to be sovereign, it is bound to be independent, and it is bound to be a republic. So that leaves socialist and secular. We all know that this didn't come at the time of the enactment of the Constitution. It came together with the infamous 42nd Amendment. But those, though they were later additions to the preamble, the values of socialism and secularism certainly animate the original text of the Constitution. The directive principles of state policy detail at length the role of the state in a planned economy. Secularism ran through the veins of the freedom struggle and is really kind of the underlying basis of the fundamental rights chapters, but chapter particularly the clauses prohibiting discrimination on the grounds of religion. And this is something that Sardar Patel had said at that time itself. We must not forget that there are other minorities whose protection is our primary responsibility. And by our, he meant the Constituent Assembly. Seven decades on, as in we can understand from the lived realities of India, both whether this vision of India as a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic has been realized, or whether we need to rethink some of this. As was being said, in an era of relentless privatization, I wonder what the meaning of the directive <coughs> principles of social state <coughs> policy are. Should we get rid of them or should we look at how we can reanimate them with life? These are some of the questions that this volume tries to get into. Mm -hmm. So I won't, I'll be very brief and tell you five stories from this volume in terms of five essays uh, that are <clears throat> which will hopefully make you want to purchase the volume outside. That's its sole and only purpose. Uh, sovereignty. So the first uh, animating value in the preamble is sovereignty, which is commonly understood as the authority to make law. The implicit assumption in political theory is that laws which are made by the people are necessarily for the people. But is this really true? And we all kind of know that it's not. So in one of the essays in the volume, Cyril Dalong Diengdo, who's a serving bureaucrat in Meghalaya, provides his experiences in implementing the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act in Meghalaya. His essay provides an on-ground assessment of how the constitutional promise of equality has worked and not worked through the Manrega scheme for the rural poor in Meghalaya. This is a very interesting perspective of how the constitution operates in practice. For many, as I briefly said, socialism is an anachronism in the constitution today. For a state that has, at least for three decades, been capitalist and avowedly capitalist, uh, the moniker of socialism appears today like an ironic and hat tip to a foregone, foregone past. But how has socialism impacted health financing in India. This is a very interesting question that Dr. Siddharth Ramji has gone into, looking at the state of public and private healthcare in India and arguing that despite living in an era of privatization, the government needs to spend more if we are to achieve our goal of universal healthcare for all. This is again the constitution in action, even though socialism may seem like antiquated shibboleth. Secularism is perhaps the most contested concept in India today. But it wasn't always like this. And there's a very interesting perspective that is provided by Professor Moidul Islam, who provides an insightful account how, of how the championing of secular politics by the communist government in West Bengal made them oblivious to questions of caste. Equally, it froze reform within minorities, the product of an unfortunate conflation between secularism and keeping minority groups insulated from reform. And some of the debates that are playing out today, you can see hints of that with the, with the ongoing and incipient debate on the Uniform Civil Code. But this is a thought that has great resonance in the political climate in India today as we strive to come with our own understanding of secularism. On democracy, B.R. Ambedkar had famously said that democracy is a top dressing on Indian soil, which is essentially undemocratic. Uh, he moved a resolution. He did this actually while introducing the draft constitution to the Constituent Assembly. So he used this argument to justify why we need such a lengthy constitution, that we really can't leave it to our elected representatives. But how long can we carry on this view? Anshul is here. Anshul has written a wonderful <coughs> essay on how democracy operates in Sasaram in Bihar, where he has had first-hand experience for several decades. And perhaps how Sasaram has proved Ambedkar's statement of democracy being a top dressing largely right. The battle to keep democracy surviving is a constant one. And as Anshul has written, that it's a battle that is still being fought. So and I think that we have to fight it everywhere where it is under challenge. 
Ultimately, when it comes to the Republic, let's end with where we began. The Dalit villagers in Karnan did succeed in getting a bus stop installed that would enable their youth to travel to the town much more easily. The fight for a bus stop took away their liberty, their, their dignity, their physical well-being, and even some of their lives. While arguably fictionalized, the film holds a mirror to the Indian state, which has a long way to go before it can be a truly inclusive republic as envisaged by the Constitution. But as I say that seven decades on into the United States of America's Constitution, they were fighting a civil war over slavery. We are not there yet, and I hope we don't get there. But this is a state where we need to build a truly inclusive republic, where Dalits, tribal persons, transgenders, women, and various religious and linguistic groups are accorded equal respect. This is a deeper issue of the citizen-state compact. Again, quoting from Mari Selfaraj's essay, the issue that we must reflect on is power and how those in power utilize it. And that is what constitutions are meant to do. It is meant to question those in power and ensure that it is a voice of the citizen in the higher echelons of power. So this volume has been truly a delight to edit, and I thank Amita and the trustees of the India International Center for giving me the opportunity to guest edit this volume and bring in such diverse perspectives. Usually you don't find such diverse perspectives in a book on the Constitution. We started working on this volume during the deathly second wave, you'll remember Amita, and we didn't know whether this volume would see the light of day. So I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted and, and I'm humbled that I'm, that I'm here today and thank Amita and her team uh, for assiduously putting this together. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the contributors, many of whom are, are here today, uh, for many reasons, for, for submitting their essays on time, but for particularly following our brief of not writing a usual essay on the Constitution, which is replete with judicial opinion and mainstream political history. Uh, this is methodologically very different, and, and I'm delighted that all our contributors today have taken a serious stride in making constitutional scholarship more accessible. I'm very aware that this is still in English, but hopefully an IIC quarterly a few years down will be in many vernacular languages as well. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to thank my colleague at Vidhi who's here, Kadambari Agarwal, who made sure that the volume saw the light of day. Uh, it really wouldn't have seen the light of day without her. It's the small things that really matter. And uh, finally, uh, I'll end by saying that the Constitution is always a work in progress. Um, and it's really, uh, as Justice Prakash said, that we must always introspect. And it is really up to us to see that the Constitution continues to evolve in a manner that makes India truly a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. And I think this book tries to show some possible directions in which we can, to which we can look for inspiration. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Arka. That brings us neatly to the end of our one hour. It remains for me to thank the speakers and the audience uh, the key point which Arga just made was the Constitution is a work in progress. Nothing is finalized yet. Everything is still developing. Secularism is developing in ways which we had not expected. Socialism, as you have said, has become an anachronism. But that doesn't mean that people should be deprived of, of essential services, of education and health particularly, where we are spending a tiny fraction of our, uh, of our uh, um, budget. So we have to redo and rethink uh, the way the Constitution is going. Intellectual will have a role to play. Whatever the politician may be, good, bad, or indifferent, um, intellectually we've got to create an atmosphere of questioning, as we've done in this volume, and of trying to see positively what can be done to improve the situation. So on that uh, note, I will thank all of you and wish you a very good night. Thank you. Seven o'clock on the dot. Absolutely. <laughs> I came in at six and I said, I think it's seven. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's your mother. <laughs>